Jack WNST, Towson Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. It says so on the hat. My uh, my hair is getting completely out of hand here during the pandemic, so much so that, uh, you know, I'm glad I, I called Strategic Factory and got these hats made, Don Moeller. And uh, it's been quite a 4th of July, and now we get into the summer months here, and we are finding, at least for this week, some of the guests we've been chasing for a long, long time. And I know it's a shame we're not gathered. Maybe we can gather under the tent at some point six feet away over there at State Fair. I took my wife uh, for some late night Brussels sprouts. Uh, we had a delicious meal. I, I was in the mood for poutine, Don Moller. Where are you going to find poutine on the 5th of July, right? State Fair. State Fair. And that's what I did. I went over to Catonsville, saw Evan. They're opening El Guapo in a couple of weeks. And of course, Fadley's delivering the crab cakes. We did a very, very important story a few episodes ago uh, here at Baltimore Positive on the crabbing industry and who picks the crabs that make your crab cakes. I implore you to go take a listen to that along with Jack Brooks from the Waterman uh, over on the Eastern Shore. You can find that one. And uh, Don Moeller sat that one out, but you don't want to sit this one out. And I know you have not been si sitting the Taharka ice cream out as well. I have loaded up on fresh Taharka ice cream, so I've been working on that. But I want you to introduce, first off, Catonsville without the 4th of July, a little weird, right? Like, I, I want to get that out before we get to Moeller and Gary and we get to this next guest because this yeah, next was, guest, we, we should have had yeah, I'm ready to. I'm ready to move on because Catonsville without the traditional 4th of July, I mean, people tried, but, uh, you know, it, it was a bit sad. But we will eventually get through this. Uh, as you said, through it all, Jeff Moeller, Moeller and Gary really continues to sell homes, list homes, doing amazing work, but... Nestor, you are right. I am so excited about our next guest. I, I, it's hard to think of anyone that would be more relevant to the conversation today than a longtime uh, Sun reporter, Antero Piatella, and the author of the much acclaimed book, Not in My Neighborhood. Uh, Antero served in, uh, reported from South Africa during apartheid. Uh, in the Soviet Union during the Gorbachev years, just a wealth of information. And as I said, his book on housing segregation in Baltimore and Baltimore County, truly a classic, should be on everyone's bookshelf. It is our pleasure to welcome into Baltimore Positive, Antero Piatella. Sir, welcome to Baltimore Positive. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, you know, I've been to Scandinavia. I, I, I actually, back when I was single, I, I dated a Swedish girl and a Norwegian girl, and I have friends of Finnish uh, uh, of, of uh, descent. But, uh, you, you know, it's, it's interesting to me. That that's the one place I haven't been. So you coming from there to here and being here so long at the Sun. Don said to me, do you know Antero? Did you work together at the Sun? And I said, I met him, like, last year at a housing conference in Howard County. But, I mean, everyone I know raves about your work, and I didn't didn't really get any time to spend with you and I said I need to have you on Baltimore Positive it took a long time so we definitely want to apologize and apologize that we're not having chicken and waffles and sitting here because we feel like we could talk to you all day long I could just talk to you about Finland for the first hour and, uh, and America and all this but but for your book and for the long tail of it and for years later folks like us to read it, to call you, to want to have you on the show, to sort of interpret it in some way into a modern vernacular, right? I, I guess Brandon Scott's going to be our next leader. Uh, I've, I'm Facebook friends with you. I've, I've seen your words throughout all of these campaigns about what Baltimore could be and what it's been. But the history of Baltimore is even uglier than I ever knew it was, right? Working those years at the Sun and my years in journalism and sports and all that, seeing this will be eye-opening if you're unfamiliar with it. Yes, Baltimore was a laboratory of segregation. It was in Baltimore in 1910 that the first residential segregation laws were passed, and everybody in the city had to live on a block where their race was a majority. And so, so uh, I had been in Baltimore for several decades by the time I decided to do this book, I had worked, I ended up working for the Baltimore Sun for 35 years. And even though I did lots of coverage about the city, there were all these questions in my mind. How did the city become the city that it is today? And me being a foreigner coming from Finland, I had been reporting on a foreign city. And so, so I see Baltimore through my Finnish lenses. And so, so this is the book that I produced. 
Well, at what point does the light go on to write a book? I mean, I've written a couple of books, but there were like, the Ravens win a championship, I'm in a parade. I'm like, this seems like a good idea and a good story to tell. C- clearly, this is a, a, an interesting story, but it's not a happy story. And I'm sure the more you dove into it, the sort of uglier the strains of it when you sort of to peel it back. Uh, at what point did it become a book in your mind? Well, it became a book when I looked at the city. I had come, uh, my first visit to the United States was in 1964. I spent the summer in New York City, and I saw the racial conditions in, 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 the, in, in the city of New York, and I particularly was struck by the fact that American cities, unlike European cities in those days, and I emphasize in those days, American cities were in constant change from one group to another socioeconomically, racially, uh, and so on. And, and so, so uh, when I then came to Baltimore, joined the Baltimore Sun as a local reporter in 1969, I realized that I had a front row seat uh, on, on racial change. And so that became uh, of great interest to me. And so this is a, another factor that went into writing the book. Well, and, and tell, I mean, re- rereading it, and, and as I said, I probably have bored people to death recently because I've been everywhere I go. I, I'm i talking about the book again. And he is I, your biggest know, advocate. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> I mean, I've read, I've read it, you know, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago, and I sit down to reread it over the past few weeks, and I just am blown away, literally. I'm sitting on a beach, and I'm reading it out loud. To my wife and to my my son-in-law and to my daughter, you know, key passages. And if walk us through a little bit, if you would, because here's what I was struck by: the absolute overt systemic way that elected officials did their best to segregate a city, starting with, as you said, segregation laws that were then struck down by the Supreme Court, but then talk about how cities and Baltimore being the leader got around that through covenant, because that appears to me, is it not really the first real key development here is the the institution of covenants? I said that in 1910, the city was the first one to pass a residential segregation law. Now, a couple of months before that city council action, Roland Park took a couple of measures. It, number one, required every uh, home buyer to sign a, uh, an agreement that no blacks would be living in Roland Park. No blacks would be allowed except for domestic servants. And three years later, Roland Park Company adopted a, an ironclad company policy that also barred any further sales to Jews. And so, so these were the building blocks for, for the residential covenants that then, after the Supreme Court uh, ruled the um, uh, segregation uh, approach um, unconstitutional, so, so, so then, then these uh, residential covenants, legally binding residential covenants, they became the rule of the land in Baltimore. And in those neighborhoods that did not have covenants, they were kind of assumed because the Board of Realtors uh, sales contract of, of, of the for, form, formula that was used, it, it assumed that, that people of uh, different color or different socioeconomic class or even uh, uh, people of different religion would not uh be permitted and it's it's kind of interesting that there are many areas of the city where residential covenants used to uh exist and and many of these have been forgotten and i remember i was talking at at in in Towson at one event and a man came later to me and said that he was glad to see that in his in his uh area Italians were also barred, and he said that he, 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 he was really laughing heartily when he told this to his wife, not really realizing how hurtful that kind of restriction might have been. And Tara, I, I want to go backward and uh, just into your biography a little bit and what you found when you got here in the 60s. 
um, as as a foreigner, as someone from Finland. But you know, I look down, and and, and we're also LinkedIn friends. And and uh, you know, you, you went to Carbondale in Southern uh, Illinois, Saluki, right? And uh, you said you spent time in New York. Give me your pathway to finding yourself in Baltimore. And and, and I have a feeling my years at the Sun were 1986 to 1992. I think you might have been in Moscow then, or you like we never crossed paths because the Sun had reporters all over the world. You know, literally that were in the paper every day in a part of the paper, but rarely at 501 North Calvert Street, right? So I, I, what did you find when you got to Baltimore in June of 1969, I guess right before we walked on the moon, and a summer after there was real unrest everywhere in America, right? I found a very dispirited and demoralized city. Uh, th- there had been white flight, uh, residential flight, for several decades before 1968, 69, but but now businesses were also fleeing, and so so. Um, but what was different, and and uh, if we use 1969 uh, as as a as a milepost, then we also have to talk about the Freddie Gray uh, disturbances five years ago, and and the difference between 1969 and and the Freddie Gray riots was that that uh, in 1969. In, in, in that dispirited city, nothing was going on. There was absolutely no construction. And in the past five years, despite all the uh, difficulties that the city has had, uh, construction goes on. And, and so, of course, it concentrates on the waterfront, but, I mean, construction is still going on. And I find this very interesting. And I have no real uh, way of understanding as to whether there is demand for all these market rate condos and rental apartments or whether we are in, in the midst of another bubble. How about that, Don? He just gave the entire inspiration for Baltimore Positive. And Taro, I live at the Inner Harbor. I put my condo on sale two summers ago. I couldn't get anybody to walk through it, and you know, and um, and that's I went. To, Don was running the county, and I said, "Let's start Baltimore Positive because we need to change a lot of things here." Uh, and Don, I'll let you jump in because I know you got a million things on the book, but I, you know, I love going back and just hearing about Johannesburg and Moscow, and I know you do too. No, I, as, as I said, I said with. With Antero, this I know this isn't going to be one appearance on Baltimore Positive. I know we're going to have multiple appearances because of the the rich experiences in his background. But if if we jump back to housing, Antero, there are themes and chapters in this book that I think particularly, particularly for our younger listeners, they're going to shake their head and go, "This this really can't be true," because. In historical perspective, it really isn't that long ago, with a lot of this stuff actually taking place in the 50s, 60s, all the way up through the 70s and 80s. Talk to us a little bit and to our listeners about the whole concept of redlining, what it was, the whole color-coded system that really led to exploitation of blacks and segregation in neighborhoods. Educate us on redlining. Well, it's interesting to talk about redlining because we already talked about the 1910 law, and that was local government in action. And when the redlining exercise was done, mapping, uh, 239 cities were mapped according to the desirability of its neighborhoods. And so, so these maps, they were, they were discriminatory and bigoted to begin with because the the highest, uh, the best category of neighborhoods, they were all modern construction populated by wealthy people of northern European ancestry and, and Protestant religion. And, and then uh, there, there were two categories where the uh, federal government in the middle of the Great Depression said lending would make sense. And, and the the topmost, of course, was one of them, and then there was a, a second, second, secondary uh, preferred neighborhood, and then there were two categories of n- n- neighborhoods that the federal government branded as not uh, desirable, and those were not given any money. Those, uh, the, the federal government uh, advised banks and lending institutions not to lend to these uh, deteriorating neighborhoods. And it's kind of interesting that 
this this uh, mapping st- uh, uh, was conducted in Baltimore starting in 1935, but but uh, in many ways the redlining legacy carries on today. And when we talk about the uh, the uh, unequal public spending of money uh, or, or uh, spending on neighborhoods, and we talk about the white L where lots of uh, public spending is happening, and the black butterfly where uh, next to nothing is, th- that is the legacy. That is uh, when where, where the, these kinds of inequalities were, were born. And and these people might be shocked, right, Antero, that, that the maps and the term redlining actually came from, according to your book, the color of the maps. In other words, the most desirable neighborhood was green, then the next neighborhood, which was as desirable, but just a slightly older housing stock, was blue. Then we got to yellow, which was sort of on the cusp and riskier, and red where you shouldn't go at all. And then your book talks about why that yellow area became the real target of the next real stain on our history, which was black busting. What was it in the yellow zone that really became the hotbed of blockbusting? Well, the yellow uh, zone contained lots of desirable housing, not the most uh, modern housing, but solid housing. And the fact was that between the two world wars, only about 100 new units in Baltimore's segregated housing market were built for black people. So the only way for blacks to improve their housing condition was to buy one way or another from from uh, white people, and so so since the banking institutions did not give any loans to black buyers, what happened was that there was a breed of uh, uh, breed of uh, speculators uh, called blockbusters who would uh, uh, buy buy houses from fleeing whites at rock bottom prices and then flip them two or three times at, at the price to black buyers uh, who had no, no way of getting le- uh, loans. And so, so uh, what they, uh, those buyers did, they, they relied on financing from the blockbusters. And so, so these rates were very strict and they were, interest rates were very high, but that was the only way. We are talking with Antero Pitila. He is the author of Not In My Neighborhood. Don and I have been wanting to get Antero on for a long, long time. How bigotry shaped a great American city. Uh, Guys, I've been holding up the the cover of the the book here, uh, you know, up onto the screen for everybody looking at it, Baltimore Positive, if you haven't. Uh, Don, just um, stump speech for the book before next question and just what you took out of the book because I I don't want to let that get to the end of – because, I mean, you've read it so many times. Well – I think the, the, the stump speech for the book, Nestor, is that when you read it, you just come away with a sense of how systemic racism is in the United States of America and why we are having the conversations and the movements in the streets that we are having today. Uh, when when you read the overt actions that government took throughout the decades to make sure that African Americans were isolated, that African Americans and at the time actually Jewish people as well into specific neighborhoods, you get a real sense of the history of the systemic racism in the nation and why it is very very difficult to address and why it really is going to take a collective commitment to a much broader sense of of social justice, uh, despite what the president might have us all all believe. And again, this this book is available everywhere you get your books, small bookstores, Amazon. I would encourage every listener, as soon as the podcast is over, to go out, get a copy of the book, Sit down and really devour it and think deeply about race in, in the United States because, Antero, I, I think you truly, you, you, you captured it. You said it's almost a laboratory of segregation. And, and the point that you made was, was very important because uh, there were two reasons in my mind when I wrote the book. 
One of them was I wanted to put everything on the table and for people, particularly uh, among the generations, exchange view ab about all of this because race, whether we admit it or not, is something that we think about every day and is so part of, uh, so, such a part of our lives. And so I just wanted us to discuss it, and, and I'm glad that on forums like this, the discussion continues. And I'm also happy that uh, there has been further work being done on, on this uh, topic of, of uh, racial segregation, redlining, and blockbusting. And what makes this so, so interesting today is that 10 years ago when I wrote this book, there was very little available. If I wanted to see Baltimore's redlining map, I had to go to the National Archives in College Park to find it. And now all this information is on the web, so that if you're interested in, in uh, these kinds of matters, not only can you find original documents on the web, but you can also f uh, find uh, all kinds of newspaper coverage on the web. So, so this is very relevant today. And Gerald, well, I, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Nestor. No, I, I need no to, Nestor, go ahead. I need to ask you uh, about, you said something that race is something we think about every day in this country. Take me back to, to when you were a young man in Helsinki and I don't know, 1961, 62, maybe you're getting a Beatles album like Moeller is over in, uh, in Catonsville. And how much was race on your mind in Helsinki and then you land in New York and you're, you're struck by all that, the same way that I'm struck when I land in Hong Kong or Tokyo, you know what I mean? Like it's the same thing to me that I'm sure you saw as a young man when you got to New York. But where race is an issue here, but but was it for you as a young man? Was it ever on your mind? Well, race was not an issue because there were no people of color living permanently in Finland. At least I did not know anybody, and we were friends with a couple of missionary families, so that we did see some. Uh, uh, people of color who were visiting Finland, but there were no permanent residents. So, so coming to New York, it was it was a revelation to see a cosmopolitan city of, uh, of millions with all people coming from from all over the world. And and so so, uh, what is interesting is that in Finland in those days there was this um, code of conduct uh, that was expected from people, and one of the a uh, tenant so that that code of content, uh, uh, conduct was that that uh, racism was bad and should be should be condemned and and so that was that was my starting point and now when i go back to finland today and there are people of color not only visiting finland but living there i see a similar uh, upsurge of racism in Finland as I, I see it here and I see it on Facebook and I see it in schools where where schools are becoming informally segregated meaning that when newcomers people immigrants come to a neighborhood school and and uh, the the uh, non-white attendance reaches a certain percentage the core Finnish white families they pull their kids out of those schools so uh, there is there there are no slums there are no uh, slums in finland and and so so but but uh, and 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 so so housing uh, does not uh, in uh, housing in finland today is not segregated but schools are becoming segregated in certain portions of, of helsinki the capital city so i uh, what i'm saying essentially is this, that finland's attitude historically has been a uh, attitude of superiority, kind of wondering why this kind of stuff happens in America. And now I think that Finns are experiencing it also in their own land. Really interesting, a, a worldwide phenomenon. Again, we are talking with long-time uh, son columnist Intero Piatella, uh, author of the much-renowned book, Not in My Neighborhood. Intero, there's so many, there are, there are key characters throughout the book. I mean, we could spend hours just talking about some of the, the, the names in the book, and we will get into some of them. But I want to focus partially because Nestor knows it's, it's personal to me because I spent much of my childhood uh, roaming the streets of Edmonton Village, uh, 612 Allendale Street, uh, 
spending many, many uh, days and nights with a great aunt and uncle who lived there, walking the back alleys to St. Bernardine's, going down the street to, I think it was the Edgewood Theater. You have a whole chapter on Edmondson Village and what happened in Edmondson Village. Uh, we have folks in our audience who still drive up and down Edmondson Avenue. Many of us that are my age still remember when it was this gorgeous shopping center with the Christmas lights on the cover of, I think it was Life or Look magazine, and there was a Hess shoe store with monkeys in the window, and our feet would get x-rayed. I mean, Did it have a slide, the Hess? Did it have a little a little slide you could go down? Sliding board? Uh, they had a little slide. They took a, yeah. a, an x-ray of your feet. I mean, Edmonton Village Shopping Center was the cat's meow. So help us, walk us through the Edmonton Village part of your book, Antero. Well, it's it's a it's a very good question because Edmondson Village, uh, in in the span of fifteen years, went from an all white community to a predominantly African American community, and it also uh, this is uh, the Edmondson Village example is good because it also underscores the link between school desegregation and racial change, because. Uh, racial change in the area abutting uh, Edmondson Village started uh, soon after uh, Gwynn's uh, Falls uh, Junior High School, which is on Caton Avenue uh, and Hilton. Uh, when, when that was desegregated in 1964, uh, soon thereafter, houses uh, were sold to black people near the school, and that's when when the panic started, and, and so uh, what, what, what led to the panic in Edmondson Village was really the belief that, that unless uh, white families sold their houses now before blacks uh, took over, that they would uh, lose their uh, financial nest egg in that the housing prices would deteriorate so, so, so much that they could not get any real money for the houses. And you point out, which I thought was interesting, the strategy of the blockbusters was to really concentrate on the quote-unquote next block, the block where it hadn't turned yet, but where people were getting nervous. Walk us through that strategy. Well, the, the uh, name of the game in, uh, from, from the viewpoint of the real estate speculators was to get listings. And in order to get listings from, from white families that may have been reluctant to sell, they created panic. Uh, they, they would leaflet. There would be all kinds of spurious stories about incidents that happened, whether they in, in fact happened or did not. It didn't make any sense. They became the talk of the town, and people talked about it, and, and people became more and more nervous. And, and so... I, I thought that one of, one of the great books about Edmondson Village is Ed Orser's book about uh, racial change there. And there is a very, very revealing anecdote in, in his book, and that is about a family living in Edmondson Village where, where their uncle lived next door. And, and yet the move out of his escape from Edmondson Village was so secretive that the first these relatives learned about it was when the moving trucks pulled in. Wow. Yeah, that's in your, yes, you mentioned that in your book. The, the other disturbing part in your book to me, and again, as a, as a lapsed Catholic, but as someone who grew up as a Catholic and went to Mass a lot of, a lot of Sunday mornings, because I wasn't allowed to miss Mass, even if I, when I was over on Allendale Street, I still had to go to Mass. Instead of going to St. Mark's in Catonsville, I had to go to St. Bernardine's. And my brother and I would go out the back door, 612 Allendale Street, down the alleys, around the corner to St. Bernardine's. And you talk about, which for me was really disturbing, the role that particularly the Monsignor played in continuing to promote segregation and what just comes off to me is the most unchristian thing I can think of. But talk about the role of the church and its uneasy part in this whole segregation piece. The Catholic Church's uh, record in the segregation measures is interesting. There were people like the Monsignor at St. 
Bernadines who uh, basically fought the war against black uh, movement to Edmondson Village. Monsignor Vape, I think you're right in your book. M- right. Monsignor Vape, yes. Right. Uh, and, and the most tragic uh, example that I mentioned in the book was a, uh, a, a, a black woman who was a member of the uh, parish and went to uh, uh, receive the Holy Communion one Sunday. And when she returned to the bench where she had sat, the white, uh, whites uh, occupying the rest of the bench did not uh, let her back in. And she walked out of the uh, church and never came back according to a priest that I talked to. Now, now that is one, one uh, side of the Catholic involvement. It is interesting then that, that after the riots in, the ni- in 1969, the Catholic Church became very in- involved in creating community organizations, Northeast Community Organization in, in the cities uh, northeast uh, of York Road, uh, that was created by, by the Catholic Church. Southeast Community Organization in Southeast Baltimore, uh, near Canton, was created by the Catholic Church. And, and the uh, Build Organization uh, also was funded by the Catholic Church. So what I'm saying is that the Catholic Church's role is very complicated, and, and so we have extreme examples like uh, Monsignor Veit in in Edmondson Village, but that is not the whole picture. Talk, talk about, and, and, and I know that, that our time is limited, but talk a little bit about some of the key players, and at some point, we obviously want you, before you go, we're going to have you talk about the noose around the city, as you referred to it, which was Baltimore County. But talk about some of the, the key players, uh, the, 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 the mayor and then Governor McKelvin. And, and, well, and the amazing Donald part Schaefer. of this, Don, is every council person, mayor, a, a citizen, that every, business owner, everyone was in on this, right? Like that, and has been in on this for a century, sort of quiet. Well, well that's a great question, Nestor. Let's put that one down. What was, as Nestor said, Andrew, was the fix in? Was everybody in on it? I well, love that pretty question. much, pr- pretty much everybody was in the sense that that most whites they lived in a neighborhood that either had had before 1948 when they they were outlawed had had restrictive uh, racial covenants uh, or 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 uh, even if those did not exist in written form they were assumed and everybody other honored those traditions and and the uh, exclusion of certain people because of their color or religion from certain neighborhoods so pretty much everybody was in on that there, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, and Taro Pitia uh, joining us here. You know, I wanted to ask you from 68 and your decision to come to Baltimore and to have seen Baltimore from afar, from Johannesburg, from Moscow, and then to come back here and see an inner harbor built, see a baseball stadium and a football team. And I mean, you have seen a lot of different kind of movement in Baltimore, and you sort of chose Baltimore. I'm always fascinated by people. I mean, Don and I, it's, it's where we're from. It's all we know. It's uh, you know where we've always been. For, for folks like you that choose here and then come here, to, for your eyes to have seen this place when it was sort of blighted out in 68 or 69 and nothing downtown, th- there really has been progress here, right? I mean, I, I guess that speaks to the Baltimore positive side of what we could become and what we've seen other places even around the world, Medellin and other places that have been gutted, that, that, they, that they can sort of resurrect and come back from the dead. And what is important in, in, in terms of discussing that particular question is that, that in uh, 1969, uh, when I came to Baltimore, I t- said that the city was dispirited. Now, that was not the whole story, though. In 1971, William Donald Schaefer became mayor of the city, and he started a campaign to change the uh, citizens' attitude about Baltimore. Uh, he, he he was campaigning against all this all this uh, misery and and dispiritness, uh, and he decided to call Baltimore Charm City. Everybody kind of laughed about it because uh, Baltimore certainly had very little charm in those days. 
but then people became believers. And that underscores the importance of our public officials and the positions and actions they take. And so, so during the Schaefer era in 1970, uh, starting in 1971, a couple of things happened. For several summers after that, we had a series of city fairs that uh, attracted hundreds of thousands of Baltimoreans and visitors to the center city to see the city after the riots. And what they saw was a, uh, well, were lots of exhibits about civic involvement, uh, neighborhood booths, uh, uh, highlighting uh, uh, white neighborhoods and, and uh, black neighborhoods, uh, integrated neighborhoods. There were very few of those. But, but that was the kind of attitude that, that uh, caught on and was particularly fostered by the Citizens Planning and Housing Association, which was very active in those days. Well, I guess it was hopeful for change, hopeful that 50 years later, and uh, listen, I live right across the street from Governor Schaefer's statue. I hope they don't throw that in the harbor at any point. Um, but I, I, I walk by and I often wonder, you know, if his eyes were open to see all of us walking by with masks and to see Harbor Place gone. And, and I got to tell both of you, before I went to bed last night, one of the last things on my timeline was this eight-minute Rouse video of the grand opening of Harbor Place being shared because it was 40 years ago this week that Harbor Place opened. Um, and and I, I would put it to both of you. And, and Don, I would ask you and, and Antero, same thing. Were you guys at those city fairs in the early? You guys were around. I was five years old. My earliest memories of the harbor literally are of, of Harbor Place. And I was 11 that summer, 11 years old. And, you know, and I remember the McCormick factory and the smell of spice and cinnamon in the harbor. But, but give me a little picture of where that was and where we are now 50 years later. Well, uh, when city fairs uh, began, and of course that institution no longer exists, one of the ideas was to highlight uh, new development areas. So the first city fair was uh, held at what today is the Inner Harbor. Uh, the Inner Harbor construction had been uh, completed, the bulkheads had been uh, constructed and so on, but there were no pavilions there. And, and so the turning point comes in 19, uh, uh, 1976 during the bicentennial when, when tall ships came to visit the inner harbor and people streamed there at all kinds of hours to see the majesty of the inner harbor. By the way, my so father took harbor, me to see the Amerigo Vespucci, and I remember that. So there you go. Yes. And, and so, so inner harbor was one, one of the sites, but there were other sites. There was, there was um, a, a city fair that was held at Hopkins Place, uh, which is uh, in the center of uh, Charles Center. And, and so, so uh, it, it was seen as a vehicle to, to uh, kind of train the spotlight on new and upcoming areas of the city. And so, so that, that was, that was a, a, a very good confidence building in those days. And Dada, where was where was before we get to the county briefly? Where was Schaefer on the whole housing issue and the segregation of housing issue? It's I, I read that part on Schaefer several times, and I don't come to a clear conclusion as to where he was. So educate me. Schaefer was a a uh, man of his his uh, heritage and past, and I don't think that he he really had any strong views, uh, positive views about uh, ending racial segregation. He saw uh, a certain type of uh, exclusiveness in neighborhoods as, as part of the strength of the neighborhoods. Uh, and, and so, so uh, Schaefer's interest was in housing, but it was not in ending, or, or in ending segregate, uh, segregative uh, practices that much. And, and so, so it, it's kind of interesting that Schaefer, and I got to know Schaefer quite well, uh, he, he, was, he was particularly uh, aware of the fact that, that giving people a house did not end their struggle in life because uh, the, uh, the, it was one uh, thing to, to make the payments every month, but in order to be a successful house owner and, and a, a, a pillar in a neighborhood, you had to have reserves so that if your uh, roof sprang a leak, for instance, that, that, it, uh, that 
problem could be addressed immediately. Seyfi was very conscious about these kinds of things. He had kind of dabbled in, in uh, very modest real estate, and, and so, so he had good contacts with, with uh, real estate owners. But but he um, he he really concentrated on uh, how on, on correcting some of the housing uh, problems and and so it was during Safer's era, thanks to Bob Embry, that that Baltimore, for instance, initiated a dollar house project if where where condemned houses could be recouped by investors for one dollar as long as they they dec- they uh, pledged to to uh, bring the uh, houses uh, up to the code within a certain time period. Well, I was going to uh, jump in with that and say the dollar houses, the legacy of that 30, 40 years later. How many of those dollar houses are now worth a couple hundred grand? Well, par- particularly if you go to Otterbein, that certainly is true. If you go to Sterling Street near Old Town Mall, uh, th- those houses are still occupied and in good condition, but there has been no real appreciation there. Well, and Tedo, I guess the not the final piece because you don't ever get to the final piece on this book. But in our segment, the Baltimore County piece, the Spiro Agnew, the Dale Anderson, and as you describe it in your book, the noose around the city. Talk about how Baltimore County and its transformation and how it truly has fed and probably continues to feed into the whole housing desegregation issue? Well, when, when desegregation, when the school desegregation and neighborhood segregation began in Baltimore County, if you did not like what you saw in, in, uh, in Baltimore City, uh, which, uh, where, where, where the uh, uh, black population was increasing, you always could move to Baltimore City, uh, County, which in, in, in the 1970s was, was uh, predominantly white. And, and so, so uh, Baltimore County was that kind of alternative because it had uh, practiced all kinds of policies that discouraged the movement of blacks to Baltimore County. There was no uh, black uh, high school until 1938, for instance, in Baltimore County. Uh, and and uh, there were uh, no uh, uh, public housing units in Baltimore County, so so uh, if 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 uh, but, but I mean it, it was e- it was easy for uh, families that were unhappy with what they saw in Bo- Baltimore City to uh, to go to the county where where um, uh, for instance it, it's in- very interesting that there was a period of time in Baltimore County during that time when. Uh, this, uh, when the county uh, actively discouraged the building of row houses because it was uh, felt that row houses attracted the wrong element of people. So in early zoning maps in Baltimore County, row houses were allowed only in two areas, in the Dundalk area and in the Lansdowne Arbutus area. Uh, other Mister, than you that, probably grew up of, in one of those. I, I grew up in that house, and my son lives in that house. It was built in May of 1951. So, so most of Baltimore County in those days was uh, zoned for one acre or more, which, uh, by definition, restricted the pool of people who could afford those kinds of houses. Now, was you, you talk about the the interesting journey of Spiro Agnew? Because you talk in the beginning, as county executive, he's seen as sort of the more progressive of the candidates, and then he wins this strange gubernatorial election when George Mahoney, the perennial candidate, decides to run on your home is your castle and try to catch the George Wallace wave, and Agnew wins then as governor as sort of this Republican progressive. But then you point out, that Agnew was no fan necessarily of open housing either. That that is a very interesting situation, uh, the the uh, Spiro Agnew situation, because when he uh, ran for Baltimore County Executive, he became 
unpopular enough so that when re-election time came, he real, realized he could not be elected in Baltimore County. So he ended up running for governor and was lucky enough to have George Mahoney as his racist opponent. So that suddenly, uh, Spiro Agnew was seen as a liberal, uh, and and so so. Uh, uh, it, it is kind of indicative also that in the gubernatorial election, uh, Spiro Agnew did not carry Baltimore County, his home base, but he did carry Baltimore City, uh, thanks to black voters. That's Pretty an incredible remarkable. history lesson that feels very twister, twisted with R's and D's in the modern era, right, Don? Oh, I, I think the history lesson is amazing. Again, I, I want to, as we wrap here, I want to encourage everyone again, go to your bookstore, go to Amazon, wherever you get your books, buy Not In My Neighborhood Today, Antero Piatilla. You will not regret it. it. As Nestor said, it's a history lesson that continues today. It's more relevant than ever. And, uh, you know, Nestor, I, I, we say we learn all of the time on Baltimore positive and Tara I hope you'll come back and join us again well I'm going to demand that we have chicken and waffles or shrimp and grits or some some good food the next time and some beer or something like that and does that sound all right that sounds good well and you know the next thing <laughs> that I don't want to talk any more about the book I want to talk about Moscow and Johannesburg and, and Finland and all of that other and your travels that's what I want to talk about with you how about that Okay, we can do that. Perfect. Don, thank you very much. And Tara Piatia, uh, you can find the book out on Amazon. Find it at a bookstore. It's a good use of your time and uh, a great, great history lesson uh, and, and not a, a happy history lesson of Baltimore housing and segregation. Uh, we are covering all sorts of bases here as we prepare for baseball season along with Don Moeller. I want to give a shout-out to all of our sponsors. We all know State Fair. We love them. Our friends at Fadley's, I want to send everybody a little bit backward in the Baltimore Positive Catalog to uh, go check out that piece with Damie Hahn that we did last week in regard to crab meat and crab picking and where it all comes from. Don and I, a lot ahead. We have conversations with Michael Steele. Marilyn Mosby is going to be joining us in the coming weeks. Uh, we got a lot of things going on around here, including some changes to our website at Baltimore Positive. Appreciate all the love. Appreciate Jeff Moeller and our friends at Moeller and Gary Realty. And at some point each and every night, uh, I'm going to have a little wake and bake ice cream here from our friends at DeHarka. We're going to have them on as well the award-winning ice cream, serving up social change, and, of course, like all great things, made here in Baltimore. I am Nestor. On behalf of former Baltimore County Executive Don Moeller, together, we're together at WNST.net, AM 1570 Towson, Baltimore. We're calm, we're local, and we're always Baltimore positive.